you. OG. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Audio, for the introduction. I, I hope you are projecting my presentation there. Just one, one second for us to do that. Please, who is uh, handling the... the pro Be fair? Please. Just one second, Prof. Please. Ladies and gentlemen, please go to the next slide. Now, my first slide, my presentation, simple introduction, macroeconomic performance, particularly in the last two quarters, and then key issues in policy. Now, the objectives of the presentation. Uh, to discuss Nigeria's economy structure in COVID-19. And I'd like to we need to talk about the fact that our economy, despite over 25 years of attempted restructuring, is actually a monocultural economy in terms of its orientation. And this has really exposed our economy to vulnerabilities particularly some standard shocks that mostly characterize global economic countries, especially in the context of the resistant COVID-19 pandemic. And that presently, the international oil market, which Nigeria significantly depends on its mass of oil is characterized is characterized by global demand and that is during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, and with an economy that is strongly informal in nature and controlling over 60% of our GDP, shutdown in economic activities during the pandemic has resulted in things that are the most important component of the 60% of the informal sector economy with their consequences for social cohesion and stability. Now, in the context of that, next slide, our economy was into recession, but In terms of controlling not up to 10% of our total real GDP, but as I said earlier, it controls so much of our foreign exchange money. And because of its strong connection to our revenue generation capacity, any slight fluctuation or distortion in that sector will have negative reverberations and multiply effects economy wide. 
And as you can see in quarter one, our GDP was slightly better than what it is. And uh, the oil sector contributed 9.25%, while the non oil sector contributed 90.75% of our aggregate GDP. Remember, in the last second quarter of our GDP performance, our GDP growth was 5.1%, which is much higher than the GDP performance in uh, real terms. But the fundamental question to ask is, what are the key specific economic factors that are driving or that draw our economy out of the session into its present relative prosperity? And these key sectors are agriculture, information and communication technology, construction and transportation. Now, Ask. It is not adequate enough, you know, but the same sectors that exist in the non oil sector are able to drive economic growth and performance means that with a better policy set in our table, perhaps our economy would have achieved much better than what it is present. Now, economic resilience in simplistic terms presupposes the ability of our national economy to withstand internal and external pressures with minimal people's and prosperity. Of course, it's a total, total order that most African economies cannot attain, and specific policy options can be marshaled to confront internal challenges. But limited options are available to stand the devastating consequences of external shocks that are global in nature, such as the COVID-19 pandemic. But as I have said earlier, with agriculture, information and communication technology, construction and transport initiatives, drivers, the main drivers that facilitated our recovery from recession, fundamental key questions need to be asked, and I am absolutely sure. With the uh, <coughs> panel, <coughs> including my teacher, Dr. Saka, you will do a lot of justice to answer those questions. Now, the first question is who are the drivers and managers in those sectors that you are economy out of? Is it public managers or private managers? Mostly private managers. And then, what is the existing policy perception? implementation and stakeholder conversation in those sectors and how about updated as the sectoral policies coupled with the years and future Finally, with better policy identity, couldn't a better outcome be But the answer 
to say it, the best way to ensure that sustainability is not to benchmark it to GDP, but to benchmark it to revenues that are accrual and useful servicing of the debt. Additionally, we have a bad dependent as nationals on park allocation, the limited capacity of subnational service taxes, and to facilitate transformative economic activities at the subnational level, which will automatically increase the capacity for tax collection and also endangering efficient tax administration at that level is also not there. We have several problems related to security challenges and economic survival. We have uh, 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 guaranteed security, a significant proportion of our agricultural production belts in Nigeria are actually not producing anything and then they are becoming dependent. We have high population growth and the need to productively mobilize it. Population in itself may never be a problem for that as productive. What we have is a rising population that is not productive and we are adding over four, five or something million mouths every year. Another issue that is confronting us is economic nationalism across countries. For COVID-19, if you look at it, every country is trying to safeguard its economic interests as much as possible. And particularly, particularly and most importantly, with the way the COVID pandemic vaccines were monopolized by most of the developed nations, so that if the developing economies cannot find their way, then it is left for them to devise strategies for them to survive and inoculate their people. And going forward, I'm sure a lot of countries will adopt uh, this economic nationalism. And I'm sure the issue of economic nationalism can also be viewed in the context of the uh, Brexit viability. Another problem is low domestic production of industrial and consumer goods and high import dependencies. This is a subtle problem that we need to address through the right ways. We cannot continue to be an import-dependent country with a rising home. So supply chain shocks tell it from China and its constant impact on global productivity and prices. The recent experiences have indicated that the, the Chinese are the, are the manufacturing hub of the world. And if there is a problem with them, it has very negative transmissionary effect elsewhere. Another challenge is lower for foreign remittances and its impact on income and social cohesion. Estimatedly, we are getting like over 20 billion every year, but certainly going forward, the remittances will have to be low because most of the economies are in a state of crisis. Most of the developed economies are in a state of crisis where 
Nigerians in diaspora are remitting money through that. Another challenge is reduction in FDI, foreign direct investment, though with minimal impact, as it is mostly portfolio investment oriented. Uh, of course, if you look at the trajectory of movement for foreign direct investment, it's mostly uh, portfolio investment oriented. Of course, it has devastating effect on the financial market, but it has no meaningful effect in terms of actual productive success of the economy because it is not uh, productively oriented. Productivity and consumption attitude, which are earlier mentioned. And finally, what is an, our challenge with healthcare delivery and future pandemic preparations? The COVID-19 has exposed our inherent and glaring failure in terms of healthcare delivery. And healthcare delivery is an important component of national productivity because a country can only be productive with healthy population and a healthy population can only be guaranteed with a very good health care delivery system at both primary, secondary and tertiary level. So in view of this glaring challenge, ladies and gentlemen, what can we do differently in order to put the country on the path of sustainable development and prosperity, but to also change the narrative about policy construction, implementation, and review as a means of targeting the economy towards improving its resilience and capacity to withstand both internal and external threats. Now, one of the key recommendations I have put in place is the need to institutionalize medium and long term development planning at all times of climate. And on the other you can see the, my, my, my various scholars and my love scholars, all my colleagues, have restored the Institutional Autonomy of the National Planning Commission and the South Asian Planning Commission in all states. And a developing economy like ours cannot afford to do without developmental planning because the developmental planning provides the roadmap for targeted intervention across sectors in order to address challenges of development in a holistic, systematic, and more comprehensive is the need for a parent review of all existing sectoral policies and programs and the alignment with medium term national development plan 2021 to 2025 initiatives and targets. I'm privileged to be a member of the Central Working Group of the Nigeria Agenda 2030. And we are almost at the verge of including this. But in the absence of the policy framework across sectors, talking to the initiatives created in the plan, then certainly you will not be able to have coherence in terms of developmental intervention. Number three is a structural transfer of public private partnership delivery policy, law, and all subsidiary legislation. Because with over $25 trillion deficit uh, infrastructure gap, public sector resources cannot and will never be able to fill this gap. So, we need to find a sustainable financing model that can deliver coherent infrastructure in this context. Number four is the need for coordinated transformation of in, if you go to any state or any local government, the state government or the local government chairman, what is the number of informal economic infrastructure existing in the state and local government you will be able to take. But in each of the states, we in various local governments. So we need to find a way of talking to the subnationals to initiate a process of this registration, which is the first vital part of the transformation of informal economic actors in uh, through formal economic activity. And we cannot also underestimate the facilitated role of the National Economic Council of the Federal Republic of Nigeria in this transformative process. 
we also need to have agriculture and it's changed. So we want introduction of guided mechanization because all cell mechanization, again, in the context of our high level supply, will lead to factor reverses and will get more problems than it is likely to solve. But we need guided mechanization in order to transform production, to transform processes, and to add value to the digital land, and then to add additional income for the subsistence farmers or medium farmers. Need to have private sector and then commodity exchanges, storage and warehousing, value chain development and financing, but importantly, export orientation and value addition. And we cannot succeed in export orientation with value addition. Without the collaborative role of the Federal Ministry of Finance, sorry, Federal Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, particularly the economic attaches working in line and in, uh, in team with the relevant officials of the Federal Ministry of Agriculture, so that at the end of the day, the export destination countries will be able to know at the issue what is their specification, what are the products that they prepare. And how do we educate farmers to enforce those specific activities to avoid point the delivery during the We also need institutional transformation of tax administration, collection, and transparent usage. Nigerians are very patriotic and they are ready to pay taxes and levies. But the public sector managers must be transparent in the way they manage tax revenues to justify imposition and compliance. Without that, you can impose so much taxes, but people can find uh, strategic ways to avoid it. We need also the structure and reduction, and then in a, we also need innovative models by, by nationals. And for them to also facilitate ease of doing business in their respective states. It is not just enough for the federal government to improve and scale up public and private partnership delivery. Each of the states of this nation that you take have one unique advantage, an opportunity that I explore, and then with, with strong collaboration. developed by the states, passion along that of the federal government. So much can be done at the state level to expand the economic base of the state and with an expanded economic base at the national level capacity to generate taxes and then provide social services uh, for the people. Social mobilization, we need to socially mobilize people toward productivity and patriotic consumption. We need to have a way of devising a coherent communication strategy at federal and state level. And then, with clear examples from leaders of our as a way of changing our way of consumption and productivity. Additionally, we need to aggressively promote domestic production and facilitation of interstate additional trade. A situation whereby a trader pick his good from Naples to my degree and he will have so many checkpoints and say multiple service is not promoting uh, internal trade. A new that quality direction is also needed that promotes productive oriented foreign direct investment with incentives relative to portfolio investment. Of course, our local savings are insignificant. We need foreign direct investment. But we need a productively oriented foreign direct investment, not opportunistic portfolio investment oriented foreign direct investment. The issue of remittance management and attraction in the context of the planning and in biodiversity, we need to have a framework to do that. Certainly, we need to put some incentives in order to attract the diaspora remittances as a way of consolidating on our foreign reserve and providing uh, external stability to our domestic powers. We need massive investment in research and preparation for future development. With the billions of dollars earned 
by pharmaceutical companies. Certainly, with a future pandemic, they are waiting for another future pandemic. But Nigeria, with a population of over 200 million, cannot afford to rely solely on other countries for the production of these vaccines. In the 60s and 70s, this country was trying to be a center of producing some of the vaccines that we even supply to the world. So we need to reinvent the way and see, see what we can do to be able to do that. Finally, we need a new policy direction to promote private healthcare provision at all levels. We can borrow from what Narendra Modi did in India with the comprehensive policy framework he put in place that has now put India as one of the choice destinations of medical tourism in the world. We have some of the most fantastic, intelligent, and result-oriented medical professionals outside the jail. But if we, if we cannot tell them to Nigeria in the present context of policy framework, misalignment and confusion. We need to get our hearts right and then facilitate them investing in Nigeria so that the money, the over $10 billion estimated to be spent every year by Nigeria, and made that country, at least will be returning to this department. Ladies and gentlemen, by concluding the remarks, we need to understand that the reality of economic development in the world today has completely been altered in favor of the economic nationality, especially in the COVID-19 pandemic, with glaring evidence in the way developed nations monopolize access to vaccines. Supply side disruptions due to rampant demand for goods and services and the stark reality of the world over the effective and China as the global manufacturing path has induced strategies and innovation on the scale this aspect. But with prayers, with prospects of a greener global economy in the horizon, fossil fuel producers and exporters like Nigeria must develop short, medium, and long term alternatives and take the reality of the world in the future without all these things. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for listening. And we have to bless Nigeria and Nigeria. Thank you so much, Prof, for that very, very eloquent uh, presentation. And uh, I'm sure the panelists uh, will do justice to that topic and expand the discussion further. And uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, at this point, I will quickly invite members of the panel. Uh, the first person is uh, Mr. Easy. Onyekbere, the Executive uh, Director of the uh, Center for Social Justice. Please, can we invite him with a round of applause? Uh, the second panelist is Professor Tunji Olaokba from the National Institute of Policy and Strategic Studies. Please, yes. But he will be joining us uh, virtually. Please, can we also invite him with a round of applause? Uh, equally joining them is Barrister Romy Mom from Lawyers Alerts. Please, can we invite him with a round of applause? We also have Dr. Lucia Omisaki, the Chief Economist of the Nigeria Economic Summit Group. Please, can you join them? And lastly, the man from Kano, Dr. <laughs> Mohamed Sagaki. <laughs> Please, can we invite him with a round of applause? Uh, I've also been asked to join them to moderate this session. Oops. So, Professor Tunji, are you hearing us? Can you say hello if you're hearing us? Can you unmute him? Okay. Yeah, I'm with you. Okay. Good afternoon, Prof. Um, Let me... Just one minute. Okay. Um, okay. 
Thank you very much for writing us. Um, uh, the Professor Dharma has uh, given us a whole lot of food for thought. Are you hearing me? Prof, I just wanted to make sure that you are hearing okay. us first. Ah, ah, okay. I thought you were you were invited me to speak. No, you will come to you shortly. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think uh, Professor Nafisi has uh, really eloquently done justice to the topic. And uh, like we said at the beginning, we want a solution-driven approach to this conversation. And I would like to frame the conversation along the way he has defined economic resilience. One is the ability to recover quickly from shocks Secondly, the ability to withstand shocks. And thirdly, the ability to avoid the shocks. Without necessarily doing an overview of his paper, I want to maybe expand us to expand his paper to maybe possibly add more to what recommendations he has made so far. So maybe on that basis, I would like to invite Professor Laupa first to make his immediate remarks for two minutes. Each of us will take two minutes to make our immediate remarks. Then we can now go deeply into our specific perspectives. Professor Lobo, you have the floor now. Meet yourself again. Okay. I think you're hearing me now. Yes, we're hearing you now. Okay. Um, uh, Professor Dharma has given us a whole lot of food for thoughts. I like to have that by saying that uh, uh, besides COVID-19 pandemic and since Nigeria has entered the economic, economic recession, what's a one of 2020, there are all a whole range of, uh, you know, pressures that uh, the Nigerian national economy has had to contend with. Uh, environmental degradation, social inequality and endemic poverty, the good governance deficit that are combined to trigger, for example, the SARS protest, unemployment, growing terrorism, and X-Men farmers' violent conflicts. Now, um, unlike these whole rural security challenges, the impact of COVID-19 has been a lot more devastating uh, and it has indeed put to test and to call to question the adequacy and uh, resilience of existing social, economic and environmental governance system. Uh, now, taking the challenge on frontally to get the economy back as called for converted efforts and I'm in line with the UN Secretary General when he said everything we do during and after the crisis must be with a strong focus on building more equal, inclusive and sustainable economy. I recovery from COVID-19 must lead to a different kind of economy. Now, what are the key issues and policy options? Uh, there's a need to address the social, economic and environmental trade-offs of uh, COVID-19 impact. Due to COVID-19 lockdown and consequent closure of industrial activity, there were such environmental sustainability gains as reduced carbon dioxide emission, improved air quality, reduced waste. But counterwise, uh, the lockdown has also led to job losses, hunger pandemic, deepened poverty. Uh, and this is again the backdrop of virtual collapse in the oil revenue due to an almost zero demand for crude oil uh, uh, in the oil market has fallen out of the globalizing nature of uh, COVID-19 and increasing shift worldwide to green economy and green technology. 
In the face, face of the virtual national platforms, Nigeria had to resort to borrowing its way to fund even by a personal cost. The multiplier effect is that with limited fiscal monetary space and headroom for government to intervene decisively through fiscal stimulus to support industry in the, uh, in the brink of collapse and to intensify the labor market to protect workers and jobs, the overall macroeconomic performance has not demonstrated resilience or inclusiveness. Yet, there were provisions of safety nets for us to balance the impact of these were technically widened out by the inflationary impact of low production activity in the economy. So we, the second policy option that we need to flag is the need to accelerate economic diversification, and I think Professor uh, Dalman has touched heavily on that, to expand revenue base, dependent on oil for revenue and national. Uh, as nat uh, the national survival and the slow pace of diversification to industrialization, given global shift to renewable energy is becoming too risky for Nigeria. Uh, unfortunately, the agricultural sector that is the driver of sustainable diversification is enmeshed in the combined negative instances of our estimate, farmers' violent conflicts, climate change induced destruction to farmers and a mix of land natural terrorism. Why violent conflicts have wantonly destroyed farmlands and disrupted farmers in Congo? Nigeria is facing a looming food crisis that has sparked food inflation to well over 21%. Indeed, FAO has formally released a land that an estimated 9.2% uh, Nigerians from 16 to 8 and FCC face food insecurity. Of, um, in terms of next step and going forward, we need to scale up investment in the healthcare system. system. Nigeria health sector needs priority and concerted action to achieve inclusive health, which will be key to Nigeria's priorities for future shock and pandemic. We need to incentivize the labor market policy to protect workers and job losses. Stimulus packages should continue to be dispensed to support efforts to build on emerging flexible working arrangements, including retrofitting of offices to ensure effective social distancing and ventilation. Telling working and different variants of working from home would hit co benefits for the economy and environmental sustainability in the composed should be reinforced. Three, we need to deepen digitalization and Nigeria's policy drive towards the digital economy. The hybrid working system that is really co benefits however, still faces challenges of poor connectivity and lack of access to data. The federal government therefore needs to accelerate implementation of its broadband infrastructure program, as this will support priority investment on in digitization of such critical sectors as food systems, agreed value chains, education system, e learning, public health care systems such as telemedicine, tele health data system and mobile health delivery infrastructure. The point cannot be oversight that the digital economy is the new norm and only reliable and affordable internet connection will benefit from the COVID-19 economy. The digitization will also enable more cost saving and environmental sustainable benefit through the congestion of cities as workers will become more willing to live in rural community and work from home. This will in turn drive greater social inclusion, equity, and work-life balance. We need to expand and be more innovative in private sector participation in infrastructure development with limited fiscal space, policies that encourage social innovation and public-private partnership arrangement that are win-win should be encouraged. Policies that target payments for alien airlines, stimulus packages for productive companies that are on the on the, on the verge of bankruptcy, and those that are retrofitting their machines to adapt to clean technology should be given fiscal incentives like tax deferral. In, lastly, intersectoral policy coordination and sustainability focus. It might appear on the surface that COVID 19 is primarily a health pandemic, but the transmission channel and multisectoral. Thus, calling for more effective collaboration and partnership 
I'm wondering for them things like health and culture, tourism, education, transportation, environment, and housing, finance budget, and national planning to enable a much more integrated system uh, approach to planning, policy design, and programming. Um, uh, I also like to join my voice in the advocacy by Professor Dharma, the need to restore the institutional autonomy of the National Planning Commission. Uh, given the centrality of the interior coordination and the fragile, uh, you know, and, and, this, uh, and that of uh, and the fragility of our federalism, I will go further to advocate that the national planning formation should not just be restored back fully. Indeed, it was a normal loss that a simple administrative merger could bring planning integrated to two major, you know. Uh, functional domain without consideration for specific principle in, in its legislation at all. I am saying that the national planning should not just be restored, but should become an office of the federation rather than the office of the federal government. Because in, uh, intergovernmental collaboration and partnership is so key to delivering the development in Nigeria. Uh, the last point I'd like to make is that we need some rethinking of regulation and government delivery business models so they are more enabling for business and national productivity uh, going forward. I thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. I allowed you to take the whole point because you are joining virtually. But I want to take maybe the conversation further. My next question will be to Dr. Sagaki, and I will take it from a layman's point of view. In uh, Professor Navis's paper, he said, uh, oil contributes about 9% to our GDP in 2020 as well as 2021, about that, while the non-oil sector contributes about 91.5%. Uh, yeah. How come the shocks in the oil international community made so much impact on our economy if oil contributes just nine percent yeah okay um so good afternoon um let me just before i answer that just remind ourselves that before covid nigeria had challenges um, jobs poverty the economic fundamentals inflation and uh, you know we all had those challenges um true um, COVID exacerbated those problems. Now, it is important to emphasize this because going, to, going back to pre-COVID days is not really an option. This is not what we are looking at. It's not to say that, okay, um, sort out all the COVID challenges and then you, you go back to, it's not normal to go back to that. We have to bear that in mind. The second message is to say that countries are taking measures to mitigate all the effects, all the problems of the challenges of COVID. And in, in, in attempts to do so, Nigeria and other developing countries are also likely to be negatively affected by the measures that they take. I think it's important for us to bear that in mind. Now, having said that, and before again, please I answer that, I think the Nigerian economy had shown some resilience um, in the last couple of years. There are not many economies that survive recession, I mean, two recessions back to back. There are very few. And it's like, it's like an individual that has, uh, you know, two heart attacks within, you know, two, three days or four days. So there is some resilience shown by the economy. Um, after the COVID, uh, I mean, just uh, in the last quarter, we, we grew by 5%. Um, and about 50% of the economy is actually expanding, you know, not only that growth, but also. So I think the key challenge when we talk about resilience the key challenge for us is to understand how we can improve the outcomes. That 5% growth that we have achieved, how do we improve that outcome? 
and how do we keep the momentum? Now, talking about the outcomes is important because immediately the government announced the, um, uh, I mean, the new growth rate, which is the best since 2015. A lot of people were asking, okay, so what happens to my income? What happens to jobs? What happens to poverty? And that is why it is important to have, you know, and to talk about um, the outcomes rather than just this. So the oil sector contributes only 9%. Um, the non-oil sector contributes 90%. Um, now, your question is how come that, you know, the economy is shaken? And this is obvious. The economic trajectory, Nigeria's economic trajectory over the years has been, you know, has had these four or five key elements. And the first one is our dependence on the oil sector for foreign exchange, uh, domestic revenue and for current account stability. So it contributes only 9% to GDP, but in reality, um, uh, the resources that we spend are generated from, from that. And therefore, it creates, like I said earlier in the morning, this fiscal system that is uncertain and that is disruptive of development. It creates a very precarious um, fiscal system, not only at the federal level, but also at, 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 at the local level. And therefore, whenever you want to talk about resilience, um, I think the first thing you do is to identify your vulnerabilities. Where are you most vulnerable? And this is where we are most vulnerable. This trajectory is not defined by only this dependence on the oil sector, but defined by other elements which are all related to this because the other elements of the trajectory are also oil sector dependence induced, which is one. The first one is the non-competitiveness of the Nigerian economy. And that is induced also by our dependence on the oil sector. Um, we can see how uh, you know, non-competitiveness resulting from uh, our foreign exchange management policy and so on. We'll come to that later. The second element um, is uh, an economy, uh, I mean, uh, economic growth that is also not inclusive. So you grow at 5% or at 8% or at 10% or at 15% and yet you have high rates of unemployment and yet you have high rates of poverty because the character of the growth is such that it's concentrated, it's, 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 it's induced by that. It's not from that 90% of the economy that is now the, the non-oil sector. Okay? And then, of course, we have that may not be related to the oil sector, but another element of um, uh, the trajectory that people ignore, but that is extremely important. And this is the population bulge, the youth bulge, population growth in this country. Now you grow the economy at 5%, which is excellent, I mean the quarterly growth. But remember what we have had in the previous quarters. The economy grows as 2% uh, um, uh, or 1% or half a percent, and yet your population is growing at 3% or 3.5%. I mean, we're in a situation in this country where you have, you know, like 20,000 babies born every day. But, you know, the implication also is that every year you have about 5 million people getting into the labor market to get jobs. 5 million people. There are not many economies in the world that can comfortably absorb 5 million new job entrants. And yet, that is what you have. Um, in the, and so, unless you address that, people will say this is a non-economic factor, but then it also affects that. By the time you grow at 2% and the population grows at you know, 3%, you are wiping off um, I mean, the gains of, 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 of growth. So, again, to repeat, if you want to talk about resilience, you have to address this, uh, I mean, your 
vulnerabilities. And the first vulnerability is from your economic trajectory, which has a number of, um, uh, of elements that I have, I have outlined. Maybe I'll stop here until, I mean, yeah, thank you. Uh, Doc, I, I ask this question because for the layman out there, we keep churning in data and you know speak very, very fine English that in most cases confuses us. And our approach to addressing those issues also in some cases does not really reflect the day-to-day -day reality. Because sometimes we celebrate our, I'll come back to them, but we celebrate that our GDP, our non-oil sector is performing well. So we are not over-dependent on oil, so gradually our economy is growing. And I remember when we were rebasing our econ economy, those were some of the justifications we gave. But in reality, just like you have said, it does not really amount to putting food on the table of the common man. That is number one. We also talk about the issue of debt to GDP ratio. Oh, we are doing well. The debt to GDP ratio is low compared to other countries. Yet, tomorrow you will now tell us 80% of our resources is used to service debt. So where are we in all of this? And the other part is every day we keep hearing inflation is declining. But in reality, cost of food is increasing. People can't go to market. So for the purpose of this discussion, we want to start looking at definite solutions, practical solutions, and simplifying it as much as possible so that we touch on the issues like the vulnerabilities you've mentioned, rather than ending at those economic theories, and at the end of the day, we are not really dealing with the issues. So, taking it from that point of view, I want to maybe ask, is on your what specifically, at the other end, what specifically do you think we can do to strengthen and further strengthen our own economic release, uh, resilience level? What will be your uh, specific suggestions? Well, very well, thank you. Um, just to identify with what was said that uh, the place we were before COVID was not a nice place. The economy had not grown and uh, we had a situation where we just came out of a recession, COVID and then another recession. So specifically, I want to address issues around government revenue and what can be done to show up this revenue. Uh, because the idea that we have to depend on borrowing to pay salaries and run recurrent expenditure is it's not a realistic idea. It cannot, have, it cannot go well for any country, a community, or a family. Nobody at all can successfully become developed through borrowing for recurrent expenditure. So one is that the issue around fuel subsidy, which is quite a touchy one, and which our friends in labor or any other part of some civil society groups will say, okay, let's return this subsidy, is no longer realistic in this day age and that we are subsidizing fuel, which is imported, so we are subsidizing consumption rather than subsidizing or encouraging or incentivizing production. So if we can remove that subsidy, particularly now, if you recall that in the last days of the previous administration, around 2015, we were doing about 35 million liters a day, but today they are reporting between 50 and 60 million liters, which is almost like we are subsidizing the fuel consumption in the whole of West Africa. And we'll be told by the CBN that that is consuming about 30% of the foreign exchange that we get. So if we can remove that, that will save about 2 trillion naira for the federal government, reduce to 2 trillion of the money they will need to borrow. Yes, there may be pains, but it can be managed uh, if the goodwill is there. Secondly, if you look at the government-owned enterprises, most of them are supposed to remit what they call operating surplus to the treasury. But what they are remitting are pittances. They've been mismanaging their money happily that under the Finance Act, the ratio of their cost to their revenue has been uh, stated to be not more than 50% now. I'm even saying that it shouldn't be a remittance. It should be a deduction. We have the TSA. Government should not allow these agencies to spend money and later report to it. What is the TSA for? We should have a situation where all government agencies collect all their revenue and do all that the expenditure through that TSA, where as they are spending, the accountant general, the minister of finance can also be looking at it on a day-to-day -day basis. So since they said, spend only 50% of your revenue, the other 50%, federal government will collect about 75 or 80, 
Government should do a deduction, not waiting for you for a remittance because government owns that money in the first place. So if you do a deduction, if you are not happy with what was deducted from you, you can now come for reconciliation. And through that, instead of getting less than a trillion a year, I am very, very sure that government can pick up not less than two, another two trillion. Added to the first one I talked about, we are discussing saving about four trillion. Now, if we move on from there, we have over the years been giving tax rebates, incentives, okay, tax expenditure to all manners of companies, including in this day and age that we are even giving hoteliers. What is, what, what, what is pioneer status in a hotel in Abuja? or oil that we have been drilling since the 40s. Why are you still giving those kind of incentives? Now we have a situation where last year, the money we made, the return revenue of the federal government was almost the same quantum with the money we gave away as tax incentives and rebates. So I am firmly convinced that what we need to do, maybe through the new Finance Act of 2022, is to set a cap on tax incentives. One is that we have been incentivizing these companies so that they will grow and create more jobs. They are not creating jobs. We are saying that they will start producing things we used to import so that we don't spend our foreign exchange. They are not doing that. Therefore, they are not succeeding in that. They are supposed to have grown over the years. They can now pay more companies' income tax to government for our revenue to grow. That is not happening. So for me, we should put a cap on tax incentives to not more than 20 or 30 percent of all available revenue. So if Five trillion was supposed to come in from those companies. We can say the first trillion or 1.5 trillion can go as tax incentives. The other 3.5 can come back. And if we do that, by the calculation of last year, we can get an extra 3 trillion naira to run the treasury. Now, moving on from there, I perfectly agree that the Minister of Budget and Planning, okay, should be split, finance, budget, and planning. Finance is like you are looking for a day-to-day -day management of the treasury, how you can fund the budget. It, doesn't, it shouldn't be on all fours with a ministry that is thinking strategically in the medium and in the long plan. So those two ministries should be split, just like we had works housing and power, everybody was complaining it's been split. Let's split them so that let them go back to where they were before so that we can have that long-term planning. And also, there was a controversy that was raised in the last couple of days when the vice president made a statement. Where in this world do you run this kind of system? that you say the official rate is 4, 410 or 420. Meanwhile, you go, get across the road, people are selling the money at 160, 170 naira over. I am not in support of devaluing the currency, but we must have a realistic unified system that simply takes away the arbitrage. Some people are sitting down while we are working, and by the time you give them a million dollars, they are making 160 million naira without working. Let's unify the exchange rate. Let's not blackmail ourselves to say, well, IMF and World Bank is talking. It is in our interest to unify this exchange rate so that going forward, we can then take things from there. Then debt limitation. The Fiscal Responsibility Act, Section 42, clearly says that there should be a debt limitation for the three tiers of government because debt limitation is on the exclusive legislative list. And this should have been done since 90 days when the Act came into force in 2007. And so I believe this is the time for us to strategically sit down. I'm not saying we shouldn't borrow, but we should now sit down and say, what are the limits of borrowing? To what extent can we borrow? For instance, in other countries, people, governments make money out of securitization of the assets of government-owned enterprises, like Aramco did for the Saudi Arabian government. So we should reform, yeah, yes, we have the Petroleum Industry Act now, we have all those new agencies that are being created. Put the right persons into positions so that over time those companies can grow and they can even be the ones through which the federal government is getting money instead of continuing having sovereign debts. Well, thank maybe, you. maybe okay. you can stop there. We'll come, back. Right. We'll come back to you. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank um, in the morning discussion, and I get worried in a lot of times when we talk about growing our revenue base, a lot of times the focus is on taxation in a fragile economy like ours. 90% of the solutions that are usually preferred is to increase the tax base, you know, collect more taxes and all that. Is that the only source of income? What about other issues like maybe our natural resources, growing the economy so that at least people can also be able to employ more jobs and all that? And this morning, we also talk about which one comes first, the chicken and the egg. Is it uh, tax collection first or providing 
services. I think there are a lot of issues. We are in a very fragile situation where businesses are trying to survive. Yet, because we want to increase our revenue base, everybody is now looking for these small, small businesses to tax. Rather, we are taxing them to death rather than encouraging them to grow. Uh, Dr. Odushego uh, Misanki, what do you have to say about that? What are your thoughts? Uh, okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think, uh, personally, I want to also uh, thank the organizers for, the, for this uh, uh, project, for the opportunity to come here and uh, discuss uh, the Nigerian economy and the way forward. Uh, for me, I think it's been very interesting from the first session where you talk about the fiscal governance, administration, institutions, and what could be done. And uh, now here we are talking about resilience and um, the way forward. Uh, first of all, I think I will also appreciate what I've heard earlier, or what our, our panelists uh, emphasized earlier. Uh, one of which is that um, when, we, when we talk about uh, building resilience, I'll come back to your question, when we talk about building resilience, uh, we always join post-COVID. We always put COVID as, as though uh, that pre-COVID uh, seems to be the baseline or the status quo. And I, and I think I love it, the way it was, it was said here, that that's, that's not even a status quo. That that's even a, uh, was a crisis period. I, in other words, it, wasn't, it shouldn't be a moment we need to cherish. We need to go you know, far beyond that. Secondly, I think we also need to ask ourselves these questions. If, you, if we say uh, we want to uh, build uh, a resilience, we need to also understand the indicators of resilience. You know, that's where we miss it. If we, if we don't understand what it means, who may be targeting so many other indicators. I mean, for instance, where you don't have any crisis, the economy is moving, everything is, seems to be okay. You will see how different actions, policy actions to, that will be aimed at addressing different issues. But when you talk about building resilience, we go beyond, far beyond that. And for me, I think it's a, a collection of uh, different layers of how government meet people, how government's activities impact people's lives. You start from the macro stability. It seems like a theory, but it's not. You can't have, uh, you can't build back to people when you are not stable in a, a macro sense. So, and I think we've talked a lot about macro stability. You talk about the uh, sectoral deepening. Um, then you talk about whether you talk about MSMEs as we refer I mean, reference them, and then lastly economic inclusion. And so, if you if you look at all these major classes or classifications, the question then is, what do we track? What do we do? Eventually, we can discuss. Uh, now we can discuss the problems, but the question is: so when we are coming out with policy recommendation, where do they fit in? You know, that, that, that to me will be very important for the government. And how do we track them? So going back to, we still need to discuss that further, so I'm not going to take enough time to talk about it. I'm just trying to set some uh, things right. So coming back to your question, uh, uh, people talk about the fact that uh, uh, we should remove uh, government from the uh, business sense of, you know, of things. In other words, uh, government needs to know that the acts or, or, the, or, the, or the, the governance itself takes uh, beyond just organizing people and making sure rules and regulations are made. But indeed, it's about identifying your limitations, what you cannot do, uh, and that paves rule for the um, paves way for the role of private sector. You see, we, we, we keep talking about huge debt accumulation because we have, we have not really identified what the private sector is meant to do. Yet the private sector is not meant to drive the economy. Uh, the government is, is to drive the economy. But the government needs to uh, channel the, the, the strength, in quote, of the private sector in building the economy. If you look at different emerging economies all over the world, and even the advanced ones, no one relies 100% on what is able, no government relies on what is able to accumulate or get to build the system. 
No, you can't, and, and, and you could see that from government is, is uh, borrowing to pay debts, or, I mean, borrowing to pay uh, salary, borrowing to build roads. This should be the fundamental rules of the private sector. If you combine whole our uh, budgets, let's say we even spend them uh, efficiently, combine them together, they cannot answer the problem, the gap, the infrastructural gap that we are, ex we are experiencing now. So for me, I think beyond the fact that you have a few people in the tax net, whether you even increase or uh, reduce the rate or have more people there, it doesn't still matter. We will see be in this conversation. The point is until we identify the model that the government will use in attracting the private sector to drive key infrastructural uh, capital spending, railway, go to different countries. Government don't just pump the money and put it there. Because most of them are long-term investments, right? So I think we need to design models, uh, PPP models that will encourage private sectors to you know, come also with government to get better, uh, better funded. There are so many other points and issues that uh, I will talk about, but, but for now, those are my major um, points. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Barista Romy, uh, Barista Eze talked about removal of uh, fuel subsidy as one of his recommendations to reduce or free up resources for other developmental uh, priorities. I've also followed the conversation around that, and one of the excuses most people have given is that uh, we are subsidizing uh, fuel that is smuggled to other countries, we are subsidizing corruption, and all other excuses for reducing or removing subsidy. And also, some have also talked about the uh, lack of production of our local refineries and all the, our productive capacity to refine pro uh, petroleum products. But I've also had people say that that will amount to subsidizing inefficiency on the part of government. Government is more or less like, we are not able to manage our borders, we are not able to do this because of that, we want to remove subsidy. What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, thank you, John, and uh, good afternoon. I, I, I would um, want to start this conversation on certain baselines. For example, uh, when we talk about the Nigerian economy, what exactly are we talking about? I guess when we begin to unpack uh, large uh, or you know, um, sentences or words that could mean several things might help this conversation. Because for me, I think the people, and when you talk about the people, you are talking about the majority of Nigerians. That is what economy is, people-centered. So yes, you can remove subsidy, but we need to think further, what is the effect on the people? Are there other means of transportation, like maybe the railways, like he spoke, he, he just talked about, that can aid this? And, and, and then again, I also wonder about the word resilient. Uh, the Dr. Gentleman spoke about the fact that Nigeria has survived to, you know, crisis, and so our economy is resilient. But again, I would like to ask a question, is our economy really resilient? when you look at those that do really matter. Uh, and, and I keep coming back to the words people-centered because we don't have to be Zimbabwe when you have to pack money in buckets or, 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 or so before. I think there is something that is already definitely broken when Nigerians who do really matter cannot afford a meal a day, cannot send children to school, cannot go to hostels. People are practically dying of hunger. There is something wrong. And, and so when we say our, the economy is resilient, I don't think we're bringing in 75% of Nigerians into the conversation. And so for me, the issue of inclusive economy is the key. And credit to government, if you ask me, in terms of the thinking, but the implementation, I think we are way off. When you talk about stimulus, or palliatives, as the case might be, to people so that there will be a base for, 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 for SMEs, which is the backbone of this country, you know, to, to, to affect families, lives, and all of that. And when such programs or monies are set aside, but corruption and mismanagement, owing to lack of effective monitoring, 
makes nonsense of these policies, then there is an issue. And I think for me, these are the critical points we should be talking about. What are the mechanisms we are putting in place to check whether it's stimulus, whether it's palliatives, whether uh, uh, policies, or, 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 or that? Because you, it's only someone who uh, probably is not thinking straight that keeps doing one thing over and over and thinks it's going to get the same result. How many times have we been removing subsidies? Has it changed anything? Where does the money go to? Mismanagement, lack of monitoring, and all of that. So for me, I think this issue of inclusive economy, looking at the woman who sells Akara, looking at the man who pushes that truck, those issues. For me, the, 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 the persons on the street, the vulcanizers, how can we help them pick up? I would say that uh, at, at a risk of um, over, you know, um, repeating myself, uh, the issue of bringing in civil society groups and civil society groups, I'm talking about uh, the, the uh, town halls or the, the community associations. If you're going to community A and you want to, you know, uh, improve the lot of Akara sellers there or the, 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 the market men here, who are the, people, the persons who are going to monitor the monies that is going to be released? How do you ensure that these monies are returned if it is to be returned? How do we break this uh, 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 country? into economic cells, cells in terms of monitoring how stimulus and packages are. Because in these days, whether it's COVID or not, we need to have stimulus, we need to have palliatives, but the question is how will they be monitored? So our economy must be people-centered. We have over the years shown that when you fund the multinationals, when you, when you give these monies to, you know, it's supposed to have a trickle-down effect eventually. That's the thinking. But the trickle-down effect has shown that it hasn't happened and may not happen, except we get down to the details. The details as it concerns the poor person. When we talk about 5% uh, you know, uh, increase in economy, for me, is a key increase. Where others are really going up and others are going really, really way yeah, down. Thank you and so we much. must look at that way down. For me, that is the issue. Thank you. We'll come back to you. Um, before we open up the floor, I uh, will just maybe give uh, panelists one more time. Dr. Zagaki, if you have uh, silver, silver bullets, what do you think? What would be your quick suggestions on how to diversify and grow our economy? Well, um, improving outcomes and growing the economy, I mean, keeping the momentum. Um, what is key, and I think has been mentioned by many of us here, you must maintain macroeconomic stability. Um, you attended the retreat, and that is key. For whatever you want to achieve, you have got to ensure. And the key elements of that stability will be three or four. The first one is you must fight inflation. Yes, it's been, I mean, it's something that we have not been able to um, uh, pin down. 17% um, has been coming down, but you have got to tackle that. Uh, you know, doing that would obviously um, get people, make several people out of poverty. The second one is, is that you must have, you must implement um, a foreign exchange management policy that would restore the confidence of investors in the Nigerian economy, that would improve inflows of foreign exchange and reduce the bleeding, the hemorrhage, I mean, getting money outside. You must do that. And I think that also featured in, 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 in the discussion. Um, uh, I like the way he puts it. Um, he doesn't want to say, I mean, you said he didn't want devaluation. I don't want to fix a rate for, the, for a foreign extent, but I want a mechanism. I want a process that would lead to a foreign extent rate. A rate, you know, that is predictable, that, you know, um, satisfy, I mean, that makes investors confident to take, to take risk and invest capital. The, the, the third element in that macro stability is 
you must address um, uh, this uh, funding, this issue of funding of um, government projects, the budget and so on. And I think the gentleman here has also done that. Uh, this morning we avoided um, the, the discussion, the key thing that needs to be discussed. There are three, I think, fundamental issues. The first one is expanding the sources that we have. And that I think people have made contributions. Um, not to depend, not to rely only on the oil sector. The second one is um, the potentials, maximizing the potentials, optimizing the potentials of the existing taxes, of the existing sources of revenue. Um, we can't avoid talking about taxes. There are only about 41 million people in this country who pay um, taxes. And if you look at, remember, the statistics I gave about the states, you know, um, for you to say um, that uh, um, revenue per capita in the states is about, in Kano, for instance, about 2,000 naira. Uh, in some places, it's about 1,000 naira. You know that you need to deepen that. And I think there's a document, a World Bank document, that suggests that Nigeria has one of the lowest ta tax rates in the world. So you need to, you know, deepen and widen um, that tax. But even more importantly, you must address um, the question of uh, spending efficiency. In 2022 budget, I think personal cost is about 46%. Uh, overhead cost also take a large chunk of that. But my brother here has raised things that we have, you know, put under the carpet consistently. Subsidy, two trillion naira, I think, that we pay in, in government subsidy. Uh, I mean, on PMS and electricity and so on. And then, of course, um, he also mentioned um, uh, the foreign exchange, uh, you know, the difference between the official rate, I, I, I and E window, and then what you have. One million dollars allocated to you would give you 165 million as you sit in your room. So again, that has to be addressed. Finally, you need to address policy coordination, fiscal and monetary policy coordination. Um, that has to be, and it is very easy to see how that can bring uh, instability um, uh, in the system. You must also address another kind of um, coordination which is the intergovernmental coordination, intergovernmental uh, uh, fiscal coordination and intergovernmental fiscal management. You need to do so. I mean, the states and local governments take about 40, 45% of all the revenue that is, uh, that is shared. And, uh, but then they are not subject to all the policies that we have. Thank you. So, so my silver bullet Monetary uh, uh, macroeconomic uh, stability, policy coordination, uh, and uh, efficiency in resource use. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, Izzy, I want you to, because you've said so much on the other issue, I want you to touch on the issue of how can we reduce states depending so much on FAC allocation? Well, I think the issue of taxation was mentioned. Unfortunately, we are discussing taxation at a time of great economic crisis, a lot of people are out of jobs, but that still does not answer the question. Many Nigerians simply do not pay any tax at all. They don't see themselves as having a responsibility. But to a great extent, you will not blame them. It's the chicken and egg theory. It's not even about service delivery. The first thing is, the man coming to demand tax from you, the government coming to demand tax, is it ready to be transparent? We are still fighting battles about asking MDAs, basic questions of what they are doing with money. We have a suit in court for Minister of Transport to explain to us the details of the railway money they collected. Details in terms of how much did you collect? One. What are the terms? In terms of how much are we going to pay back? Did we mortgage anything? Because we've had stories from other parts of Africa where the Chinese came in and took over critical national assets. Instead of telling Nigerians that, the man hired a senior advocate and met us in court. 
Hello? And then, that's the same person you want to entrust more with your suite. So until we resolve this issue of government transparency, go and see the 2022 budget. Go to the Minister of Agriculture. Five billion, cassava value chain. 10 billion, cotton value chain. Another 10 billion, rubber value chain. What, does the, what is the definition of a value chain? And we've been doing this since the days of, since 2010. I've been following these budgets about value chains. And each of those value chains must have gotten 100, 200 billion. But has anything changed? Where are you investing the money for the value chains? So we've got an I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being worked up. The government is simply irresponsible. People running affairs are not ready to change. Sorry. So it is going to be difficult to convince Nigerians to part more with their money without that change from the other part for them to become more transparent. So the first thing is increase government transparency. Tell me what you are doing with my money. I live in Abuja here. The local governments in Abuja don't do virtually nothing. Local governments in the states, sometimes they pretend they grade the roads in the rural areas. Local governments in Abuja, you can't pinpoint what they are doing. So in essence, the states will take a cue from the federal government. If the federal government is doing well, the states will take a cue. And when you discussed about inflation and the GDP growth and how it impacts on people, I think the basic thing now is security. Those people living in IDP camps, if you give them the opportunity to go back, like in Benue State, they don't need any government to feed them. They can do that. This is the first time new yams are coming out and the price of yam is increasing, simply because those who used to farm yams are no longer available to go to the farm. So it's a simple, straightforward thing. Thank you. Thank you. So talking about shocks, you're talking about shocks. Romy, uh, Izzy just mentioned the issue of security, insecurity on agriculture, and agriculture was mentioned by Professor Nasivi as one of the key drivers that helped Nigeria come out of the recession. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Sagagi also talked about the issue of food insecurity and the hunger that is coming. What do you think government should do, or we should do rather? This is really very interesting. Um, like about five years ago or so, I was in Kaduna uh, facilitating a workshop with farmers, trying to get, ask farmers what they really, what were their issues. And I kept hearing kidnapping, kidnapping, kidnapping. I, in my heart, I really was amused because I didn't believe that was an issue or that was, you know. So I stopped the workshop halfway and I said, look, anybody who was in kidnap here, I want to see your hands up. I got a shocker. Everybody's hands was up. All the farmers' hands were up. And that was five years ago. So I think uh, Eze has just said what the issue is with agriculture in Nigeria today. Uh, this issue of food security is just starting because we are unable to protect the farmers. Security, I mean, uh, uh, so uh, in Benue, we, I, I come from Benue actually, and, and I will tell you this, that yam, rice, which are the stables and you know, every family can afford it, is no longer being, you know, uh, um, cultivated. And so if you can, if you take Benue as a case study, you can multiply that all across the country. So I really, really, really wonder what the, uh, would happen nine months from now. It's going to be really, really bad. And, and, and that also goes to the issue of, uh, in, uh, you know, investors having some sort of... Uh, confidence in the, in, in the country. I think where we are paying lip service to the issue of security, especially in the hinterlands, where our food comes from, um, I, 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 I don't think it's a, it's a smart or clever thing to do. So for that silver bullet you're talking about for me would be that we need to think more about security. Uh, Nigeria today, sorry John, Nigeria today for example has less than 320,000 police officers, you know, uh, uh, looking at the entire, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, population of over 200 million. And of these police officers, most of them are senior police officers, the younger, the, 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 the lower police officers are with VIPs. So in earnest, this is the period where we have the most unsecured uh, uh, country in terms of civil policing, and we need to put our money where our mouth is. I think the issue of uh, 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 recruitment in large swaths and batches, training 
giving them a, 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 a uh, you know, equipment to work with and all that. These are really critical. And so when we're talking economy, economy, and we're not even thinking about things that can wage the shocks that it needs and all of that, security is really, really very important. Thank you so much. Um, Doc, your silver bullet. Yeah. Well, um, so the, the only thing I uh, will contribute uh, is the fact that um, we have seen the problems um, and I think it's a good thing sometimes when uh, the challenges are identified. Um, but the next thing for us to do is to know how to build, bet how to build back better together. And I think that is the point. Is also reason that we shouldn't just be looking at the whole layer alone, but also look at the bulk, the, uh, the bottom of the pyramid, uh, which signals the most important uh, part of the part of the economy. And so, and how do we go about that? I think we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We only need to realign it. Um, there is not going to be any new, uh, innovative way of doing things now. We only need to ask ourselves simple question: uh, Where are we? Uh, where are we going? And that—that's a simple. Uh, very, I mean, those are very simple questions. If we have a clear uh, um, focus to say this is what we want to be in the next three or four or five years with respect to all these major indicators that we've identified. I think the next thing for us will be what will it take us to go there. So I think the, 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 the sincerity, the efficiency, the, the capacity from both the states and the non-state actors will be needed at this time. We can rule out so many policy recommendations, but we still need to look at how this can be implemented. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we still have about 10 minutes for to round up this panel. Ah, it has generated a lot of issues. But let me also inform us that in the end, this panel will have a syndicate session. So that is where we go and really distill the issues. This is for now just to uh, crystallize this discussion. So, uh, Prof, I won't call you now. You Let me give the opportunity to those who have not spoken. Uh, Ayo Makinde. <laughs> yes. Okay, I am Akin Day first, Dr. Yadudu, you second, and the prof, three of you, Dr. Zasha, let's take four of you first. Uh, one minute each. Can somebody pass the microphone? Prof, I'll come to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, good day, everyone. I just want to ask questions. Um, how can we have economic resilience without fiscal governance? All of the issues discussed in the morning only points to one thing. We have a choir that is discordant in the MDAs. One of the issues raised in the morning was that there are agencies that do not remit to government and those that do not respect the TSA. Then my brother, Dr. Lawa, spoke in the morning and said we have about 39 agencies collecting taxes, levies, and all. How can we produce when an average SME will literally die paying taxes? And we know that no small business can survive five years without serious help from anyone. A good number of economists have said over and over again, unless we are producing, we can never get out of anything that's a problem that we have. I mean, Mr. Mutu, you spoke the other time about inflation declining. One of the things that we understand, and economists have also told us, is that inflation is not declining. Only the rate of inflation 
is declining. So it means that we have quite a tough job on our hands. On the one hand, we have inflation. We have insecurity. We have inability to produce as we ought to produce. So again, I'm asking the question, how can we have economic resilience without fiscal governance? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, Dr. Adudu. Okay, thank you very much, uh, panelists. Uh, once again, my name is uh, Dr. Muhammad Yadudu from Damgote Business School. And uh, I really enjoyed the uh, paper presented. And one of the things Professor Dharma mentioned is that uh, India and Narendra Modi uh, had some structural changes. And from our own research, we have seen that no country that doesn't have an adequate social safety net is going to be resilient. And I think it's clear that in Nigeria that the amount that is spent <clears throat> on social spending is really below what it ought to be. So I need the panelists to maybe clear that up. Um, the second question I have uh, has to do with um, the ability of the, the country to actually attract investment. So foreign direct investment has been falling uh, since prior to COVID. So going back to pre-COVID days, as Dr. Sagagi has said, is not really the option. So what does the country need to do to take us back to maybe 2011 levels of uh, FDIs? And the third one, and I'll be quick on this, uh, really, I don't think taxation is the problem, but the people who are taxing is probably the problem. Uh, taxes in Nigeria are very regressive in the sense that they fall mainly on the poor. So we need to see a situation where we are taxing people with private jets way more than how much we are taxing people, such as I as a lecturer in Bayer University. Thank you. Uh, yes, Prof is here. Uh, thank you very much. I am Ali Rafidade Sanusi. Uh, Amadabili University's area. Um, you know, when you said one minute, I got shocked as if I say, okay, please, I have um, forfeited my... But let me try. You see, I, I see this feature coming out from the morning in this panel, and I feel quite strongly about it. Uh, we are 60 in one estimate, in some estimates, or 75% informal as an economy. What does that mean? It means we're not only having activities, 60 to 70% of which are registered and are not paying tax. No, it also means that people who are responsible to collect tax are not sure that when they collect tax today from this particular location, from this unregistered uh, activity, would tomorrow come to the same location and take, so, and, and, and take the same uh, tax. So informality is huge as a solution to both the resilience as featured in Prof's paper, you know, one of the panels was saying when you wanted to support the households and businesses during COVID, we had issues administering them. Why? Because we don't know them. You can't really, so there is opportunity for people to say we have delivered when they have actually not delivered. So that's for even supporting them resilience. In terms of taxing, 60% 70% are paying taxes, activities are taxed. And then you tell me 6.1% GDP to um, tax to GDP ratio, and that is small. No, it is huge because it's only 40% or 35% of the activities are taxed. So there is huge tax burden because of informality. There is pressure on government to raise taxes, it's very clear. From morning presentation, the recurrent alone has taken everything we can generate with this heavy tax burden. Any practical entrepreneur will tell you 
that it is so difficult and nearly impossible, especially if you operate your enterprise in sub um, urban area, to, 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 to build capital. That tax is expensive. I run um, a bakery, and I know what it means to give a VAT of then 5%, now 7.5%. The margin is so narrow that, you know, think of the pure water businesses. Think of the Akara, if you have to, for instance. What, am I, what point am I making? And that's on the one hand. So we know the problem with formalization, uh, informal economy. The thing is, who is responsible? I blame the subnationals. And this is the point that was not made. Uh, please, let me make this point. The subnationals, by law, are the custodian of um, uh, the land on which buildings are made, the markets, the houses, and so on and so forth. They do nothing and allow people from the villages, so urban, rural drift, come and settle in an area, slum. And that's the beginning of informal activity. How do you formalize Nigeria? I think the most of the responsibility is on the subnational. How do we coordinate the subnationals to ensure that henceforth, you know, formalization, um, you know, you know, you know, is 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 in is 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 in our design for development. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. And uh, Dr. Zasha. My name is James Zasha. I'm a private consultant, Olivia Makudi. I want to point out two abnormalities and highlight ways of going about them. One. The, the fact of things that should be at the center being made peripheral in talking about revenues and expenditure and public financial management. One of them is service delivery. We should be at the center of discussions about revenue and expenditure. When you listen to the Minister of Finance or Commissioner for Finance, they talk about budget performance. What they're talking about is the percentage of money spent against what was voted for. And they can clap themselves that, oh, we have done very well. We spent 80% of what was budgeted for. There is no story of what did the money buy. And I think that's what the budget should be addressing. We should move to talking about outcomes. You spend so much, we're talking about cassava value chain, that value chain. What did the money buy in that value chain in terms of outcomes? So put service delivery at the center of public financial management. Second, the issue of citizens. Citizens raise the question of whose, whose revenue are you talking about? Public revenue, who owns it? And why such a lackadaisical attitude towards public money? Would like those who are in government are stealing, or those who are outside are not questioning? And I think John, give me one minute to profile my bush meat theory, which explains why people can be so lackadaisical. If you go to a community and you are a stranger and you catch a goat, I want to take it away, they won't allow you to take it away. In fact, you'll be beaten up and the goat collected from you because the goat belongs to somebody. If in the same area a stranger sees a grass cutter and catches it, he'll be celebrated. Why? Because grass cutter is bush meat. And that is how public resources are regarded in Nigeria. Public money is nobody's money. So when people steal it, they are celebrated. They are stealing bush meat. And also should hold them accountable as celebrating them because public money is nobody's money. Until that mentality is changed, people will go into government and want to eat bush meat, and nobody will query you. And those outside will see people eating public money, they say, oh, it's bush meat, nobody is querying you. But therefore, let's begin to put citizens at the heart or the public financial management, consulting them. Not about, let's, let's operationalize the rhetorics of citizens' engagement in the budget process. Thank you. From the beginning, they ought to be engaged right to the level of auditing. Thank so you. what I get from you, your silver bullet, is that there should be <laughs> uh, citizen-centered policy, planning, programming, and service delivery, right? And they should be in the center of the whole of it, right? Uh, we'll just take two last ones. Elijah Suleiman Angora, then we'll take. Uh, okay, you're happy? 
Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I really appreciate the way the discussion is going. But my question is uh, to the panel, especially I want to talk about the issue of we have been talking of public sector reform. And when we talk of public sector reform and we look at our overhead and the money we spend in our budgeting process, leaving nothing for development, the question is that what is actually this expenditure? Why is it that they are so high? People have mentioned one person having two to three, four, five cars moving in a convoy and all these things, and it adds to the overhead we spend. Apart from that, the COVID experience have shown so many things in different places of uh, different countries of the world that some of the jobs that we think we necessarily need to keep people to do the job that we don't need them now. How are we reforming to make sure that in Nigeria today, let us, to, let us take a critical look at our public sector and define, do a job audit as to what really needs to be done. We have technology have thrown out some of these jobs and we still have this lock of wood hanging around within the civil service and we are not doing anything about it. What do we do? Because if we don't do this job or they do, and define exactly what to do, because if you have a company and you have 20 people and five people can do the job and you continue to keep the 20 people, then the drain from those 15 will continue. And I think that is exactly some of the major problem we are facing. So until we have the political will to sit down and say, look, we are going in the next two to three years to reform the public sector in such a way that we will keep those critical to our need to perform the jobs that will change the economy of this country and move so forward and look at ways we will disengage these people and make them productive. Because definitely, whatever we are doing, we have to look at how productive are we. We can shout, we want to do this, we want to do this, but how do you relate that to our productivity? as a people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I will just crave your indulgence, ladies and gentlemen. I know we still want to talk, but we just need to wrap up this session. Uh, we said two, so the last person will be from uh, PwC. Perhaps Dr. Kuba can take the last slot. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the opportunity. I think just to mention, uh, three points, but are very quick. So the first one is in terms of policies. So some of us who deal with investors every single day, small, large, multinationals, we can easily tell you that the biggest problem we have as a country does not require money to be solved. It's just policies that come in the way that you can't get anything done. Whether you want to import or export is a nightmare. Small business just doing business, you have 35 regulators coming to knock at your door every day. The rules are not clear. They move the goalposts as they wish. So we need to address that, but we have to use evidence and data. So the conversation in the morning, for example, around fiscal fed federalism, I have a different perspective because the revenue generated in Nigeria, tax revenue today, about eight, only just eight, account for 98%. <clears throat> of these eight, about five of them are with the states. Personal income tax is the highest revenue yielding head in the world. Even in America, it's shared between federal and state. States alone have it in Nigeria. They have stamp duty 100% to themselves. Land belongs to states in Nigeria. In the US, they have less than 10%. ETC. So let's use data for policy reform and do things that are going to facilitate Business. The second one is asset optimization. So Nigeria is fixated about owning assets, even when the assets are, in principle, liabilities. And we've seen about the refineries. Over the past few years, we spent over 100 billion naira not to even refine a single barrel of oil. We have the Petroleum Industry Act now 
and we want to continue to own assets. America produces more than 10 million barrels per day. They don't have a national oil company. Some countries have it, and they're making money, but we are not making money, so that model cannot work for us. NMPC in 44 years has barely declared $1 billion profit. That's what Saudi Aramco declared, $25 billion in three months. So let's sell off all those assets to private sector who can run them efficiently, make profit from it, and then pay taxes to government. The last point I want to make is about Nigerians and our mindset. So there's always this mindset, and I think I like the analogy of the bush meat. There's the, anal there's the mindset of, well, what can only me do? The whole system is corrupt. When I find my opportunity, if I cannot find it, I'll go to another country. We need to develop not even taxpayers as customers, but as investors. A customer can easily move on to the next supplier or seller of what they are looking for. An investor will ask questions, they will not move on easily. Thank you very much. The questions, I will uh, advise that those questions will be answered at the groups. We don't need to answer them here. We are going there to continue the discussion. I promise you we are conscious of time and we'll close just when we have agreed to close. So we won't keep you here any uh, longer than the time we've agreed. Uh, having said that, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it's been very, very fruitful discussions we've had there. I know a lot of us still want to talk, but we'll have a whole opportunity to do that elsewhere. And I want to beg all our panelists, please avail yourselves, because we still need to continue to tap from your brains. There we will provide concrete solutions that will enable us to conclude the, the communique that we want to present to the world this evening. So I thank you. Please, can we give our panelists a big, big, big round of applause? Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. For time now to do the announcement for the session. Please hold on. Can we take our photo? Hold on, sir. Stop. Stop. Oh, sure. Thank you. Let's appreciate John Mutu and his uh, panel of uh, eminent resource persons. We appreciate you most sincerely. So at this point, we are, we are getting close to lunch, and it's not the time to uh, delay movement. Otherwise, there will be protests. Uh, so what we're going to do now is to prepare for the breakout session. And then um, once we finish doing this, each group will need to meet briefly to work out the process before we proceed for lunch. So once we come back from lunch, the groups can sit down to put their thoughts together. Then we'll create time for the presentation. Okay, so we can finish before they go for lunch. Okay, good. I think it's better to finish before we go for lunch because by the time we go for lunch, lunch may interfere with the flow of thoughts. When we just come, then we can do the presentation. So what we're going to do is to just, uh, since all of us have listened to the first panel, first keynote panel, then the second uh, keynote and the panel discussion, we can do random allocation to uh, the four groups. Groups. A and B will focus on fiscal governance. C and D will focus on uh, economic resilience. So we'll do the uh, division, then we'll, we'll, we'll lay out the 